Mm. Good evening, Senator Rowe. Good to have this opportunity to talk with you on this evening. We are looking forward to uh, worshiping in our building Sunday, uh, November the 1st. Uh, hopefully, you have seen the video set up and sent out by Brother Gatson. There are some guidelines that we are to adhere to once entering the building. And so there will be those who will be responsible for ushering you to where you need to sit. Uh, there is a fever checkup that you have to have before you can enter the building. Um, and there are, we will practice distancing and there are quite a few other things that we will adhere to once we are at the building. But I'm excited and I hope that you are excited about being able to uh, come back together to worship our God. It's been a long time. It's been eight months, going on nine months, somewhere around there, but it's been a long time. And I've been talking uh, to you, most of you, some of you, and uh, I know that you look forward to re-entering the building, and I'm excited about that as well. And uh, it has been said, and looking at uh, guidelines, uh, if you're sickly, it would be better for you to stay home. And if you're 71, 72 years old and older, you may need to stay at home. <clears throat> but I'm hoping that you got to see the video. And uh, I know that Brother Gatson did not stand in the job presenting that and the uh, directions for entering, re-entering uh, the building. So we look forward to seeing you and having a great time in the Lord on November the 1st, that Sunday coming in the building. Um, today we're studying uh, Matthew chapter 27 and we're talking about uh, the trial of Jesus and uh, that chapter 27 deals with, you know, the death of Judas Iscariot. You remember Judas Iscariot who uh, betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So Jesus is betrayed by Jesus. And then uh, when you begin at verse number 11, you see where Jesus stood before uh, Pontius Pilate. And uh, Pilate really wanted to let Jesus go, but the people wanted Jesus. They wanted him crucified. So in verse number 27, you see where he is, Jesus is being mocked. And have you ever been made fun of? Have you ever been mistreated, done wrong? They planted a crown of thorns and they placed it on his head. And a scarlet robe they placed on his body. They were making fun of Jesus. And then they took our Lord out and they began to crucify him. Begin at verse number 50, it talks about his death. One of the things that sticks out about the death of Christ is when he said, it is finished. The Lord, our Lord had done all the things. He had completed all that God sent him to do. Then Jesus was laid, when you begin at verse number 57, in, 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 a, in a sepulcher, and they had that, his enemies had the sepulcher guarded and because they didn't want it, they didn't want it said that he resurrected from the dead. And so they placed guards there to keep anybody from coming to steal the body of Christ and saying he is resurrected. However, by the time you get to chapter 28, you see that he is resurrected and not because anybody moved the stone, but because the stone was moved and Jesus was risen from uh, the dead. So what I want to uh, do is talk about this text because on Tuesday, November the 3rd, 
there's going to be a presidential presidential election. Uh, either uh, President Donald Trump uh, will be reelected, or Joe Biden will be elected uh, to be our next president, the president of these our United States of America. Some have deemed this presidential election the most important election of all times, and I'm not going to. Uh, sit here and try to persuade you who to vote for, but I will try to encourage you to make sure that you vote. Make sure that you vote. Because not only is this election important, but every opportunity you get to vote, you should go out and vote. In our study, people had the opportunity to choose Jesus. It was either Jesus or Barabbas. And instead of choosing Jesus, they chose Barabbas. What was the difference between Barabbas and Jesus? Was there any difference? And the answer to that question is yes. There was a difference between Jesus and Barabbas. Well, what was the difference between Jesus and Barabbas? Well, Barabbas was a robber who had committed murder and an insurrection. And he was in prison at the time that Jesus was on trial. Well, what about Jesus? Well, the Bible tells us about Jesus. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 21 and 22, he said, for even here too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth. There's a big difference between Barabbas and Jesus. Barabbas was a sinner, a known sinner. But the Bible says Jesus was sinless. Looking at that and understanding that, guess who the crowd chose? They chose Barabbas over Jesus. Now, it was Pilate's wish to release Jesus, not Barabbas. Even his wife warned him, have nothing to do with this just man. But when we read verse 20, we see that the chief priests and elders, they begin to encourage the people to release Barabbas. And so they selected, they chose, they uh elected Barabbas over Jesus and Jesus was crucified. What I'd like to do with this text today is I would like to submit 10 reasons why we should choose Jesus. 10 reasons why we should choose Jesus. We always have to choose. We have to choose what we're going to wear. We choose what we're going to eat. We choose whether or not we're going to work. We choose what we're going to get our education, we, we always have to choose, and we have to choose who we will follow. In this election, uh, we need to choose to follow Jesus, all right? So I would uh, choose Jesus because of whom he is, because of whom he is. That's why I would follow Jesus, number one. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He was trying to explain to unbelieving Jews that he was God's son. They were not ready to accept that. They kind of knew Jesus. They watched him grow up as a young man. They knew his mother. They knew his father. They knew his sister. They knew his brothers. And for them, it was impossible for Jesus to be the son of God. But he says to them, before Abraham was, I am. Now, you have to go all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, where when God is sending Moses back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. One of the questions that Moses asked the Lord was, whom shall I say sent me? And to make a long story short, God says, you say, I am, have sent you. So that phrase, I am, is a name 
And when you go back, Jesus says to these unbelieving Jews, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, they couldn't accept that because Jesus wasn't about to be old enough to be living before uh, Abraham, but they didn't understand that John 1, verse 1 through 3, talks about Jesus being in the beginning with God. And so he was before Abraham. So Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He also said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the door and I am the good shepherd. He said, I am the resurrection. He says, I am the true vine. And then probably one of my favorites, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so I would elect Jesus and be willing and ready. And I am following Jesus because of whom he is, of whom he is. If you don't know Jesus, you need to get to know Jesus. If you've never met Jesus, let me introduce you to Jesus. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He's the Savior of the world. He died on the cross that we might live. And so I would elect Jesus this year because of whom he is. I would elect Jesus because of what he says he will do. Because of what he says he will do. Now, not everybody that says that they will do something actually does it. But I would elect Jesus because of what he said he would do. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, verse 29, he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. And I want to read another passage because the Lord doesn't make empty promises. He doesn't make promises that he can't keep. That's why Peter said in 2 Peter 3 and verse number 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness, but it's long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Isn't that wonderful to know that the Lord keeps his word, that the Lord keeps his promises? that the Lord does that. And the Lord's not willing that anybody should perish. That's why the Lord gives us time to get it right. You wonder why wicked and evil men live so long and it seems like they're getting away with murder. Yeah. No, God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. And he gives everybody an opportunity to get it right. So I would elect Jesus on this year because of what he said he would do. He said that he would give us rest. And I, I elect Jesus because of what he said he would do. I would elect Jesus this year because he loves me. Jesus loves me. In John 3, uh, 16, 17, he said, for, the Bible says, for God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God sent his son. Jesus was willing and ready to come and die for us because he loved us. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us. Now we are taught in the scriptures to love each other as he have loved us. We are taught to love one another and not just those who love us, but we're also taught to love those who are our enemies, love them as well. And so I would elect Jesus this year, uh, family, because I know that he loves us and I would elect Jesus because I know he loves us. I would elect Jesus Number four, because he died for me. Jesus died for me. When I read Romans chapter five and verse six through verse number eight, the Bible says, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That would be us. 
Then Paul says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God, but God, commending his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what are you saying, Paul? He said that Jesus died for us. <clears throat> he died for us when we were still sinners. He died for us when we were helpless and couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus didn't wait till we got it right. We couldn't get it right without Jesus. He came to help us get it right. He died for us. When you look at Matthew and you see where Jesus was marched up Golgotha and you see where he was nailed on that tree and you see where he suffered, and bled and, <clears throat> and then died. That was him. He died for us. So I would elect Jesus this year because he died for us. He died for me. He died for you. That's what Jesus did. You know what Jesus did? In other words, he took my place and he took yours. So I would elect Jesus this year. Pick Jesus. Choose Jesus. And these are just some reasons why I would. Number five, I would elect Jesus because he saved me from my sins. I was in my sins. I was not born a sinner, but I became a sinner. Jesus, Jesus saved me from my sins. In 1 Peter 2.24, the Bible says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whom, by whose stripes ye were healed. Isaiah 53 and verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus, in other words, saved us from our sins. When, when Jesus commanded baptism, and we can read this in the Bible, one of the purposes for baptism is that when we are baptized, we're baptized for the remission of our sins. Jesus saved us from our sins. When he died on that cross, when he died on that cross, the Bible says when that Roman soldier pierced him in his side, the Bible says that blood and water came out of his side. And, and when we go down into baptism, that's where and when we come in contact with the blood of Christ. And had it not been for the blood of Christ, you and I would still be in our sins. So I elect Jesus because he died for my sins. Matthew uh, 26, and I'll just turn to Matthew 26. And uh, verse 26 through verse uh, number 28, we normally read this during the uh, uh, communion. But if you'll notice Matthew 26 and verse 26 through 28, the Bible says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And people could not benefit from that shed blood until Acts chapter 2, when the gospel was preached and people were baptized, their sins were washed away. So I would elect Jesus because... He saved me from my sins. Only Jesus, only, only Jesus could save me from my sins. So I would elect Jesus because he saved me from my sins. Um, number six, he modeled an exemplary life. He modeled an exemplary life. That's what Jesus did. He didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk. He set an example for all of us. He set an example. 1 Peter 2.21 For even here unto where ye call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And we may be wondering, what are you 
What are you talking about, Peter? Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And let's see what he's talking about. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, I'll just read that, that verse again and finish out the chapter of chapter 2. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. And what did he do? Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now watch what the Bible says in verse 22 through verse 25. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now return unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. Jesus lived an exemplary life. He set a good example. An example worthy of, of emulation. And so I, I would elect Jesus because he's, he's an example. You know, not not everybody that teaches and preaches or is a Christian sets a good example. And pray for me that I will set a good example. Number seven, I would elect Jesus because he redeemed me. First Peter 1, 18, 19. First Peter 1, 18, 19. Here the Bible says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, Jesus redeemed us. That word redeem means he bought us back. He bought us back. He paid the price. There was a ransom and he paid it. We have been redeemed. We were lost in sin. We failed uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. And, and, and Jesus redeemed us. I'm glad that Jesus paid that ransom. I'm glad that he paid that price. There was no other way we would still be in our sins had it not been for the price that Jesus paid. He redeemed us. Number eight, he gave meaning to life. Jesus gave meaning to life. And I like this one. John 10 and verse number 10, where the Bible says, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Man, abundantly. Abundantly. Listen, listen. God did not intend for Christians to live gloomy, boring, defeated lives. But on the contrary, the Lord wanted Christians to be happy, free, and overflowing with adventure. Now, we're not to live our lives in sin. That kind of fun is prohibited. But to enjoy living and to enjoy spiritual life which is only in Christ Jesus. So Jesus gives meaning to live. You haven't lived until you have lived for Jesus. Jesus gives meaning to life. Number nine, he leads. Jesus leads. He leads. Um, I can read the 23rd Psalm. There's only six verses, but watch what David says. Jesus leads us. He's our leader. He's our captain. He's our author. So Psalms 23 and verses one through six says, the Lord is my shepherd. That's what David said. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He leads. Jesus leads. He leads. You know, we need, we need leaders. We need leaders, but there's nobody like Jesus. Nobody like Jesus. And last but not least, and I love this last point that I'm going to share with you, that I'm going to submit to you. I love this last point. He changed my life. He changed my life. I want to, you know, I, I'm going to read about a person in John chapter 9. Jesus changed his life. And he can change your life too. If you're, if you're looking to do better, Jesus can change your life. And I want to, in John 9 and verses 1 through 11, it's about a man <clears throat> and how Jesus changed his life. He was, he was blind. And I, if you've never been blind before, you don't know what that's like. I don't know what that's like. But imagine, uh, blindfold yourself where all you can see is darkness. Then you get some idea of what it must have been like for this blind man. Not to able ever be able to see the beautiful lilies on the top of a hill, the beautiful setting of sun. We can only imagine what that would, would be like. But he, but the Lord was able to change this man's life. The text, John 9, 1 through 11 says, and as Jesus passed by, he just happened to be passing by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. This man had never been able to see. And his disciples Asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither have this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God to be made manifest in him. Back then and even now, people relate a couple uh, misfortune with sin. They figure if you have any kind of misfortune, if you're unfortunate, it is because you've done something wrong. But Jesus said, that wasn't the case. Sometimes it is the case, but on this occasion, Jesus said, no, that's not the case. Um, but that the work of God might be done. So he continues, he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, the Bible says he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind said, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes. And I said unto, and, 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 and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Jesus changed his life. Jesus changed that man's life. And you know what? Jesus changed my life. And you know something else? Jesus can change your life. But let me talk about this a little bit more. Let me talk about this a little bit more because I love this story. This man had never been able to see before in his life. Never been able to see before in his life. But Jesus changed this man's life. Jesus changed this man's life. <clears throat> Jesus just so happened to be passing by one day. Saw this man born, born blind. Born blind. And uh, his disciples thought, well, you know, he must have he must have done something he didn't handle business doing. You know, we say stuff like that all the time. He he must have done something he didn't handle business doing. He 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 got what he deserved. Uh, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. Jesus said, no, 
this man is like this because God is about to show y'all something. God is about to show y'all something. So Jesus tells the man, Jesus, Jesus spits on the ground. And then he makes some mud with the spit, spittle. Takes that, that mud and he puts on the eyes of the blind man. He said, now, go wash in the pool of Salah. Why would Jesus do it this way? Why didn't he just say, blind man, receive your sight. He could have done that and the blind man would have received his sight. But there's a reason why Jesus did it the way he did it. Perhaps he wanted them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he did it. There was no other way. He did it. Okay? Okay? It's just like when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He called Lazarus' name twice. And then he said, come forth. He wanted them to know that he was doing the resurrection. He was raising Lazarus from the dead. In the book of John, it says, many other signs and miracles did Jesus do that are not even written in this book, but these are written why Jesus, so that they would believe. This man <clears throat> believed Jesus because he went to the pool of Siloam. He didn't stand there and argue with Jesus. He didn't want to fight Jesus. No, no, he didn't even question Jesus. Obviously, he went to that pool and he washed. And the Bible says he came back seeing. Jesus made a difference in that man's life. So people knew him. They knew him. They, they knew him all his life. Isn't this the man that was born by? How is it now that he can see? And... It was all because Jesus changed his life. Now, Jesus changed my life. That old song, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Jesus changed my life. You know what? He can also change your life. Just before I uh, conclude from this lesson, you are, you're, Hopefully you're, you're planning, if you haven't already, vote. Vote. You need to vote. Uh, uh, some had to, had to fight for the right to vote. Uh, and now we can vote. So take advantage of that. And if you haven't voted already, make sure you go out and vote. <clears throat> if you don't vote, please don't complain. If you marched, if you protested, vote, vote. But by all means, don't sit at home and do nothing. Vote. <clears throat> I've shared with you uh, 10 reasons why we should elect Jesus to rule our lives. That's what this lesson is all about. 10 reasons why we should elect Jesus to rule our lives. That last point was I, uh, Jesus has made a has changed my life. And I hope that he has made a difference in your life. If he hasn't made a difference in your life, let Jesus make a difference in your life. If you want better, Jesus has better. If you want more, Jesus has more. Amen. If you want new, Jesus has new. Amen. <clears throat> Let Jesus make a difference in your life. Thank you for uh, letting me come to you and talk with you. Please uh, uh, make sure uh, that you wear a uh, medical mask when you come to Worship Sunday. Uh, not only are we going to have seating uh, in the main auditorium, but when you come into the building uh, to your right as a fellowship hall, we're also going to uh, sit people in there uh, as we have to practice uh, distancing and you may not be comfortable in a room full of people and if you prefer sitting in the fellowship hall you can sit in the fellowship hall supposedly there's going to be a screen 
there where you'll be able to watch the worship service there in the fellowship hall. At least you'll be able to hear it. And so uh, we look forward to seeing everybody Sunday. Make sure you come uh, uh, prepared and to to and not only prepared but to to adhere to the uh, guidelines that has been prepared for us. Uh, again, I want to thank Brother Gatson for taking out the time to do the work. Uh, he, he has been very busy and doing an extraordinary job, and we certainly appreciate him for doing that. Uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you Sunday. Looking forward to having a great time in the Lord with you. I miss it. I miss you. I miss... Now, now we're not going to hug each other and kiss on each other and all that good stuff. That's going to have to wait. At least don't do that in the building. Once you get out in the parking lot, you can do pretty much what you want to do. But while in the building, please don't do that. Uh, so let us adhere to the uh, guidelines that are prepared for us. I look forward to seeing you. God bless you. I don't want to let you go now. I want to keep talking to you, but uh, I, I really miss you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again. I hope that you're doing well. I hope that God is blessing you. I know that God is in the blessing business and that he blesses us every day. Even when things don't go the way we want it to go, I know that God is still in the blessing business. Because as bad as things may be, I guarantee you right now that they can be worse. I'm glad that it's not worse. So let us continue to pray. I want to also uh, put a plug in for Brother Eddie Sanders. He has a book that he has uh, 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 put out. Uh, it's a good read. Uh, it's encouraging. It's inspiring. Um, if you want more information about that book, please uh, contact Brother Eddie Sanders. And I think his name is uh, documented uh, in uh, in our, um, our directory. If not, please see me or give me a call. And I will give you his uh, number. You can order you a book. I know I have my copy and I'm so proud of my brother. He is uh, doing wonderful. Uh, he and his family in Tennessee and we want to continue to pray for them uh, uh, during this time. Uh, let us remember uh, uh, Brother uh, Warford. He's, he's doing better. Praise God. Thank God he's doing better. And I want to thank uh, Sister Warford for keeping us up with the updates uh, on him. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that good news uh, that he's doing better. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Hines. As Brother Hines has passed, uh, that the Lord continue to strengthen her, that she might be encouraged to continue to stand. Uh, this could be a difficult time, but she's strong, and that's what the Lord wants us to be. The Lord wants us to be strong. Amen. So let us continue to be around her and with her, and let us continue to pray for the entire church, that the Lord will hold us together. This has been a test. It has been a test. Uh, it has been a test. And not only for our congregation, but all the churches of Christ throughout this broad land and country. Let us continue to pray for one another. Let's pray for our preachers. Let's pray for our deacons. Let's pray for our elders. Let's pray for their wives. Let's pray for their families. And let's pray for the church. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you again for tuning in. God bless you. And we'll look forward to talking to you uh, the next time. Bye-bye.